Welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us this evening with, for our uh, fourth forum on community perspectives on justice and the Chauvin murder trial. My name is Sarah Davis and I'm honored to serve as the executive director of the Legal Rights Center in Minneapolis. Thank you for joining us for this critical ongoing community conversation on justice in the context of this trial. The Legal Rights Center is a community nonprofit law firm in Minneapolis founded in 1970 by the Black and Native American communities in Hennepin County and later joined by immigrant communities as well. We continue to be led and operated as a community driven law firm. And it is our mission to work with our communities to seek justice and promote racial equity for those to whom it has been historically denied. Today's forum is part of our ongoing work focused on being responsive to community legal needs. This forum is just one in a series of events and educational resources that we've been supporting over these last weeks. Please check out our website to learn more about the work that we're doing to access our educational videos, to learn about spaces that we're holding for restorative processing, and to learn about our community legal support. Um, it's now my honor to introduce you to our um, panelists who are here with us this evening. Uh, Nakima Levy Armstrong is a civil rights attorney, activist, national expert on racial justice, former law professor and legal scholar. She's the executive director of the Wayfinder Foundation, which provides support for women of color activists and organizers around the country. She's also the founder of the Racial Justice Network, a grassroots organization that organizes and leads protests and demonstrations, provides community outreach and resources and challenges injustice within systems that impact black people and other people of color in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities. <clears throat> Mary Moriarty is the former chief Hennepin County public defender a role she served in for six years. She was also a core faculty member of Gideon's Promise for 15 years and the 2015 recipient of the Stephen Bright Award. She's on the faculty of public defender trial skills programs around the country, teaches at Harvard Law School, the National Criminal Defense College, and runs the Criminal Defense Clinic at the University of Minnesota. Tonight, we also have with us Justin Terrell. He's a community leader with a track record of executing successful issue campaigns. With an expertise in criminal justice and democracy reform, he has led campaigns to expand fair hiring and remove barriers to voting. He has mobilized thousands across the state of Minnesota and has worked to develop community members as, act, uh, as advocates, organizers, and leaders. He is uh, currently the executive director of the Minnesota Justice Research Center, bringing his leadership and expertise to an organization whose mission is focused on transforming Minnesota's justice system. And last but certainly not least, we have Carolyn Gross, a national leader in clinical pedagogy, narrative theory, and critical lawyering. She's been a professor at Mitchell Hamlin Law School. At, she is a professor at Mitchell Hamlin Law School, and she is the director of their skills integration, um, has developed and taught courses in family law, evidence, trust, and estates. She's published <clears throat> extensively over the past 20 years, mainly on equity and power issues, narrative and pedagogy. So with that, uh, we are streaming live on Facebook and welcome all of you here for this discussion this evening. Um, tonight's panel, uh, although as always, we are going to be talking about the community perspective on justice in the context of the Derek Chauvin trial. Um, Part of our context for this conversation tonight is the police killing of Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center on Sunday. This has been a lot for so many members of our community. And so I'd like to start with Nakima and then turn to Justin to hear your perspectives on this week and the community perspectives on justice in the context of former officer Potter shooting Dante Wright. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for continuing to create safe space for important dialogue in our community. And thank you to the Legal Rights Center for all of the work that you all do. I was actually just at um, Hennepin County Jail yesterday with Garrett from the Legal Rights Center um, and uh, Maddie from uh, National Lawyers Guild. And we were visiting with those who had been arrested outside of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. It has been a very intense week since Dante Wright was killed. I just left the Brooklyn Center Police Department. There are folks gathered out there from all walks of life who are continuing to be vigilant in demanding not just manslaughter charges as we saw um, announced a couple of days ago, but also pushing for murder charges against Kim Potter. I know that there are folks who will buy into the mainstream narrative that, oh, if 
Dante had just done this or if Dante had just done that, he would still be alive. But we know as black people in Minnesota and across this nation, that no matter whether you're riding in a car while black, riding in a car while black with an air freshener, or you let the police know that you have a weapon or you have no weapon, or you're standing at the back of an ambulance, or you're uh, standing on a street corner with your family, that those things at the end of the day do not matter to law enforcement in terms of their encounters with us that unfortunately all too often become deadly encounters. And that's what we saw in the case of Dante Wright, a 20 year old young black man driving a nice white car, living his best life, minding his own business when Brooklyn Center Police decided to pull him over. And they pulled him over in the midst of a pandemic claiming publicly that the reason they pulled him over was because of expired tabs. When uh, Dante was being pulled over, he called his mother, Katie, and told his mom that he was being pulled over because of an air freshener hanging from his mirror. And so that was a pretextual stop. Um, and it was used as an attempt to harass and intimidate Dante and bring him into the system. And we know that ultimately that ended in a deadly encounter because Kim Potter, a 26 year veteran, decided for some reason that Dante was a threat, claimed that she was trying to tase him and actually shot him. The fact that she called out taser, taser, taser means absolutely nothing. She should have known the difference. And I believe she did know the difference between a taser and her firearm, which she held in her hand for several seconds before she fired that deadly shot. So now we are grieving once again, as we were already dealing with trauma in the midst of this Derek Chauvin trial where we saw George Floyd essentially being put on trial for his own death and where we saw bystanders, most of whom were black, pleading for the police to stop choking the life out of George Floyd, being demonized by the defense in this case and the prosecution having to work into their case a justification for people just being human and trying to use their voices to intervene in a deadly police encounter. And so all of this reinforces the notion that black people are not safe in the state of Minnesota, that there needs to be a complete overhaul of our system of policing and that we need the average white Minnesotan to not only pay attention to what's going on, but to use their voices to stand against injustice and to see our humanity. Thank you, Nakima, so much. Justin, I wanna give you a chance to weigh in here. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so I appreciate uh, uh, Nakima's comments. Um, you know, I mean, what is there to say? It, it's impossible to be a black man in Minnesota, right? Like we continue to see the brutality from police officers in our state. Um, and, and I think that <clears throat> what's striking in this moment that we're in right now is that law enforcement couldn't even make it through the trial without committing another egregious attack like this. And I use the word attack on purpose because our communities are under attack. We're under attack by not just policing and law enforcement, but every system that is supposed to be designed to serve families and support family infrastructure in our state fail black folks. And frankly, in a lot of occasions, attack black folks. We don't have the economic resources. We don't have safety. We, we just don't have what we need to thrive as a people in this, in this state. And I think it's important um, that we're focusing on policing right now because the legacy of policing in the state is just egregious. Um, we have sundown towns, lynching, the lynching in Duluth, hidden slaves in St. Cloud. The history is there and it's never been reckoned with. And until we reckon with it, like we, we, like what are we supposed to do? Of course, people are tearing stuff up. Of course, people are angry. These are rational and reasonable reactions to the, to the pain that's been inflicted on our people. And I also think it's important to reflect in this moment that, you know, had the had we had the police not murdered another defenseless black man we we they would be able to be out protecting businesses they wouldn't there wouldn't be tear gas going into people's apartment buildings and whatnot and so it's important that we keep the focus on the profession 
and, and remind the profession that it needs to uh, reckon with its history. It needs to reckon with what's currently going on today. And um, as a people in Minnesota, I, I do wanna say something to community um, like that we, in this moment, like we have to, you know, channel our rage, our outrage, channel our anger, all of that is appropriate, but it's also appropriate to remember that anger is a secondary emotion, that, that people are feeling hurt, people are feeling sad. Some, some of us, like myself, are feeling lost. And I think that if we focus on those primary emotions in this moment, we get a little bit closer to our shared values and understanding of what, what causes those things. It's the loss of another life. And as somebody who is no fan of the criminal justice system, our criminal legal system, you know, I actually don't think that, you know, it, more incarceration is the solution. I don't, you know, while some people want to see this officer go to prison and whatnot, and I, that makes total sense to me. I actually think we need to like tap in to the values that we hold close to us, ideas like trust and hope and humanity, and make sure that we're lifting those things up as we fight for justice, even though this, even though we have to, we have to use the system to, to respond uh, to the, the crimes of these officers. At the same time, at the same time, we are ultimately in the fight and struggle for our humanity. And the reason we need to transform the justice system is because we need a more humane system. We need a trans, we need to have transformative justice in the state of Minnesota. One where we are building bridges across differences, where we're working together, where communities have more resources to address harm. We need, we, we, right now there's crime going on in the community. I was talking to a Northside resident last night um, about how, what's going on in their neighborhood and young people that I know and that I care about and, and, and their safety is at risk. And we don't have anything to keep them safe right now. Not that policing is that answer, but we're struggling to come up with alternatives. And the only way we can do that is if we work together and we continue to dive deep together and affirm the shared values that we have. I, I'll just close with this, you know, Marion Kaba, uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I don't know that I can fashion myself an abolitionist, but she definitely does fashion herself one. And, uh, you know, she, she just reminds us that there is not a single era in the United States history in which the police were not a force of violence against black people. And I think that no matter what happens through these trials, no matter what happens through these protests and, and, and how people are feeling right now, like knowing that that is the, the, the foundation of policing, even in the state of Minnesota, is a call to action to transform the entire profession. Thank you, Justin. Um, and again, thank you, Nikima. I really appreciate both of you sharing your perspective on that. You both referenced um, the need to transform law enforcement and transform policing, um, and also the need for accountability. Nikima mentioned the second degree manslaughter charge that's been brought against former officer Potter. Um, and also the that you know there's a very strong feeling within the community that that is lacking. Um, you know, particularly when you look at in the context of what the Hennepin County Attorney's Office charged former Officer Noor with um, second degree murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. Both of those circumstances, both Officer Noor and Officer Potter uh, are claimed to be mistake it, mistakes, right? Accidents. Um, why, do, why is the system, why is the county attorney's office choosing to believe that for, in the case of Officer Potter, but not, why did they choose not to believe that in the case of Officer Noor? There has to be some uh, reckoning with the racial undertones of that. Mary, I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about what is second degree manslaughter? What do you see as the appropriate charges here? And you are muted. I'll start out by unmuting myself. Um, I followed uh, former officer Noor's case very carefully. And one of the things I noticed about it was that he was treated like many public defender clients, um, aggressively charged. And I wanna remind people, he was charged by the Hennepin County Attorney's Office with intentional second degree murder, uh, which this was officer Noor. I mean, he, he was frightened. Um, he shot out of his car. That was manslaughter in my mind. But not only was he charged with intentional second degree murder, he was charged with third degree murder, which was really a statute not designed um, for that particular situation. And many of us expected that uh, his conviction on third degree murder would be reversed by the appellate courts. Uh, ultimately, the Supreme Court has accepted review of it, and many people think that that conviction will be reversed. 
uh, but we don't know that yet, and we won't know that until the end of this year. So I think one problem here is that there have always been two standards of, I won't even say justice, but the way people are treated, the way public defender clients or clients of color are treated are very aggressively prosecuted. So knowing that there are two standards and then right in the middle of the Chauvin trial and seeing that he is charged with unintentional second degree murder uh, and third degree murder and manslaughter, I understand why people would be questioning why uh, former officer Potter is only charged with, with manslaughter. Uh, one of the things that I would like to see actually is the body camera of the other officers to see what she was doing. I think there's a lot more information here to look at, um, but it certainly, it was not an accident on her part. The question in my mind was, did she actually intend to shoot him with her gun or with her taser? But taking a step back, what was she doing at all? She had no business using force on him at all. Um, he was pulled over for the license tab, uh, as Nakima talked about. There was some talk about a ridiculous air freshener. And he had a warrant, but it was for a gross misdemeanor, non-person crime. It was for a first appearance that he missed when the court sent his date to a different address. And so I doubt that he ever even knew he had a court date. Uh, and so, you know, apparently they're arguing he tried to drive away. Um, what would ever justify the use of a taser? Um, and so I, I don't even know why there was a use of force there. Manslaughter is really the lowest level charge of that, that involves the death that we have, second degree manslaughter. It requires culpable negligence. Um, I, I am certainly hopeful that the county attorney is doing additional investigation about Officer Potter to see what her history looks like, to take a look at the body cam, to interview people, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, charge her with something different. Um, but I, I understand why people are angered, uh, because why is it that the first officer ever to be held accountable by uh, for killing a civilian was a black officer who was aggressively charged um, for killing a white woman? So I completely, I mean, I don't understand. I try to understand how people are angry about what once again seems like very different standards. Yeah, if I can just pick up on, on what all three of you have said, I think it's the, the charging of former officer Potter is a fairly predictable um, example of this narrative that has gone all the way back. And Justin and Nakima both referenced this, the history of the police as a force of violence and oppression of black people um, based on this narrative of reasonable fear of black people, that that this idea that she reached for her taser and it's kind of a reasonable mistake. Oh, you know how this blonde white woman has a reasonable fear of this young black man. That's based on centuries of this narrative of black men as dangerous, particularly to white women. And so this notion of, of, of reasonable fear is supposed to be an objective standard, but in fact, you see it working against, as, as Mary describes, against African-Americans or in, in Mr. Noor's case, Somali Americans who, who are, are reasonably afraid this person comes up to the car and, and scares him, but that's not the narrative that our legal system is based on. Our legal system is not based on a narrative of black people afraid of white people. The narrative that has the weight is that white people are reasonably afraid. And so in order to, to prevent the, the lower charging of Officer Potter or the um, acquittal of, of former Officer Yanez in the killing of Philando Castile, he was found to be reasonably afraid of Philando Castile. On, on what basis? On what basis was he reasonably afraid? The simple basis that Philando Castile was a black man. So the, this legal system that, that Justin and Nakima talk about as not a system of justice for African-Americans, for Black people in America, based as it is on these narratives of fear, reasonable fear 
of black people, regardless of the, the circumstances. And that the, the reason that Mohammed Noor is prosecuted so, um, so severely and is convicted and is serving time is because his narrative, his fear of a white woman is completely counter historical. The legal system doesn't make room for that, doesn't make sense. It is not reasonable. And you see the defense in, in the Derek Chauvin case doing this also, that building up this idea that Chauvin was somehow reasonably afraid of the scary black man lying on the pavement or reasonably afraid of the scary black mob of teenagers and children standing on the street corner, that these are the assumptions, the, the stereotypes embedded in what we call our justice system. And until we can kind of surface those, not only in like lefty panels, but in the mainstream discourse, which I see happening, that no, these trials are based on embedded assumptions that a conviction of Derek Chauvin is not going to solve. And in fact, when we get, I think when we get to talking about the closing arguments, we'll see that in fact, the state's case in many ways is furthering the very narrative that we are fighting against, this idea of systemic white supremacy, that Kim Potter is just a bad apple, right? Derek Chauvin is just a bad character. It's not a systemic problem. It was just an accident. She reached for her taser. It, it's a one-time thing. Until we recognize that these, the low charging of this cop in Brooklyn Center is a symptom of, of so much more. And we can't keep saying, oh, it's not us. It's, it's Mr. Wright should have done this. Or, well, she, she meant to do this other thing. It's a mistake. We're, we're rearranging deck chairs on that Titanic. We have to start accepting the iceberg, right? Thank you, Carolyn. I appreciate you jumping in. And Mary, thanks for your analysis on the, the charging. Um, just my last prompt here for us to talk about before we move forward to talk about Derek Chauvin's ongoing trial. Um, Nikima, I wonder, or Justin, if one of you want to talk a little bit about the law enforcement response to the protests and what we've seen in terms of interactions. We're now on our fifth night um, of, of protests and really problematic interactions and aggressive force by the law, by law enforcement. Very dangerous and aggressive force on the part of law enforcement. What people should know is that this is by design. Um, in the aftermath of the uprisings that happened last summer after George Floyd was killed, we had quite a bit of civil unrest. And we have people in positions in law enforcement who decided that they were going to respond to the civil unrest with a much more aggressive police response. And so um, even going back to November when we had a demonstration the day after the presidential election and we were walking on I-94, we wound up being kettled by law enforcement and trapped on the freeway for five hours. 646 of us were charged criminally and those charges are still pending. Um, right now, which is a huge waste of resources. And that was really them practicing on us in terms of this new um, multi-jurisdictional operation safety net that the Department of Public Safety has put in place at the behest of Governor Waltz and head of public safety, John Harrington. So since that time, we have seen other things happen such as the barricades around the courthouse in uh, downtown Minneapolis and other buildings around the Twin Cities, barricades, chain link fencing, barbed wire, et cetera. And so what um, law enforcement was doing was gearing up for the possibility of more civil unrest pending the outcome of the Derek Chauvin trial. What they didn't count on for some odd reason, because of how often people have been killed by police in the Twin Cities was for police to yet show themselves again through the murder of Dante Wright at the hands of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. And so in that time, what we've seen is, again, that multi-jurisdictional operation safety net um, charade um, still being uh, in effect 
in essentially taking over the Brooklyn Center Police Department. We have the National Guard there. We have the Hennepin County Sheriff's there. We have state troopers there. And the first night we had the Brooklyn Center Police Department there. And what happened for those who aren't aware was that um, word got out about Dante Wright being killed. People gathered in Brooklyn Center at the location where he was killed, primarily young black people who were around Dante's age. They were outraged, not only that Dante had been killed, but the dehumanization that they witnessed with his body laying in the street for five hours. And rather than police being sensitive to the trauma connected to this situation, they showed up in a very aggressive way. Um, in riot gear, a very aggressive stance. Um, when we got there that afternoon, um, we knew that tensions had been escalated and we were trying to you know, keep you know, people's energy at a certain level because of course we know what happens when things escalate. And so once they got uh, Dante's body out of the street and law enforcement proceeded to leave, the energy there began to shift and it became more of mourning. And then the young people decided to leave from that spot and go to the Brooklyn Center Police Department. And so as organizers in the community, folks who care about young people, we went there as well to try to protect our young people because we already knew um, what law enforcement could and would do. So they responded with tear gas. They responded with rubber bullets. They responded with flashbang grenades um, and other projectiles. And they turned out the lights outside of the Brooklyn Center Police Department and inside so that you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see the badge numbers of the officers. And apparently some people may have been throwing water bottles or rocks or whatever at the police. I can attest to the fact that the majority of the crowd was peaceful, but with the lights out, police were able to use that as a justification for indiscriminately using chemical weapons and other munitions against protesters. Again, mostly young people around Dante's age. And as the projectiles, well, first of all, they gave us 10 minute warning to disperse. They said, if, we're, if you don't leave in 10 minutes, then we are going to arrest you. So we all moved across the street. And when we moved across the street, police again responded with all the things I just mentioned. We would see projectiles shooting over our heads, flames, and, and going over those apartment buildings as if people didn't live there. And the people who live there are mostly black people, low income people, people who are renters with children and families, people looking out their doors, children afraid, hiding under their beds as a result of what was happening. And we were of course disturbed, outraged, fearful. People were physically injured that night, had to go to the hospital as well. Smokes of tear gas, people couldn't breathe. It was like we were in the midst of a war zone, not in the midst of a circumstance where people are grieving and understandably upset because the life of a 20 year old child was taken. And so the next morning we showed up at City Hall in Brooklyn Center. We demanded that the chief of police be fired. We demanded that the city manager who has oversight of the police be fired. We demanded the name of Kim Potter and that she be fired. And so through a series of events and advocacy, th that afternoon, the city manager was fired. The chief of police was on the chopping block to be fired because the city council had passed a resolution. He was allowed to resign beforehand. And then Kim Potter was allowed to resign beforehand as well. And so since that time, this multi-jurisdictional unit has taken over. And when you go there, you see the armed guard, the uh, National Guard out there fully armed. And then at, when it gets dark, that's when extreme violence begins to happen. All the weapons that I mentioned, coupled with kettling people and arresting people. People's wrists um, have marks on them who are in jail from the, um, the, the, the ties that they put on people's hands being so tight. People were, have been manhandled um, and had their car windows bashed in and things like that. And, and the police are using the excuse that, well, they're hitting us with you know, water bottles or this or that. And, and that to them is a license to use all the toys and all the militarized weapons at their disposal 
against protesters, again, most of whom are young people. It's unconscionable, it's inexcusable. I hold Governor Waltz and John Harrington ultimately responsible. Thank you, Nakima. And you it, know, I it, really appreciate you um, walking us through that. And just, I hear you, Carolyn, but for the sake of time, we do have to move forward to talk about the Chauvin trial. I do just want to say, um, you know, we, I think we can drop in the chat here, but um, check out our, check out the resources on our website for folks who are going to be out. We are doing on the ground, know your rights training, train the trainer models for folks who are going to be out at a protest so that you can know your legal rights. And if you know somebody who's getting arrested, we have a legal support hotline. And as Nikima mentioned early on, our staff is down at the jail every day, um, interviewing folks and, and helping folks get out. Um, who have been arrested. Um, we could probably, without a doubt, spend our whole time this evening talking about the murder of Dante Wright at the hands of the police. Um, and I imagine we will be back together having a conversation about this again in the not too distant future. I do wanna move us forward to talk a little bit about um, the Chauvin trial because there's a lot that's happened. Um, there's a lot to talk about and unpack. Um, all the evidence is in now. Um, you know, the uh, the state rested their case a few days ago. The defense rested today, and so I'm hoping we can start with just a conversation about uh, how it has all played out. Mary, would you would you kick us off with just your analysis of how this has played off and played out so far uh, at the trial? How the evidence has come in and what you see, and I'm hoping everyone can jump in for a dialogue now that we're moving towards closing arguments. So I think that the state uh, really covered its bases because it had to in terms of cause of death. And I will say, I think that's the hotly contested issue here. I think the defense is going to try to argue there's reasonable doubt about why George Floyd died. Uh, having said that, the defense case, in my opinion, did not go well at all. Uh, the state was very effective in cross-examining uh, those witnesses. Uh, one of the witnesses was trying to say that carbon monoxide poisoning was a contributing factor, which I thought was ridiculous. Um, so I, I do think the state has a really strong case. Um, but as you know, people who do trial work can tell you, none of us have gotten to lay eyes on this jury. I have been told um, by reporters that have been in the room that have seen the jury that it probably couldn't be better for the state than it is. Um, so that's a positive thing. Um, and I mentioned this because I want to mention it again because it's going to be brought up. Um, as a defense lawyer, I look at this case, I look at the defense, and I struggle with it. I actually don't struggle with it. I know that this is not the way I would try this case or defend this case. I know it isn't the way that Sarah would. And part of that is because of the dog whistling um, about the crowd, um, the... <laughs> you know, trying to characterize the people who were actually traumatized by having to witness this and struggle with that trauma and guilt every day uh, has angered me greatly. Um, I agree with, with, with others who have talked about how we need some, well, we need a lot of work on the system, but I think that this televised trial has pointed out to people some of the things that happen in trials that actually happen every day. And even as defense lawyers, you know, people have said, well, do you think, I, you know, do you think the defense knows this? You know, I have no idea, but it's not okay. It is not okay to try to go Donald Williams um, into an, trying to be an angry black man. Uh, it is not okay at all. Uh, and so I expect to hear the defense talking a lot about this angry crowd, uh, which didn't exist. I expect to hear them talking about how there's reasonable doubt about what actually caused uh, George Floyd's death. But I do think that the state did a very good job of calling expert witnesses, not only on use of force, but also the medical issues. So I feel pretty good about you know, going into closing arguments. And I, like I said, I haven't seen this jury, but I feel hopeful um, about the, the type of case, or at least the, the fact that the state has covered legally what are those important bases but i know it's going to be i can imagine extremely traumatic for people to listen to the closing argument of the defense and hear some of these arguments um, not only about the use of force um, this angry so-called mob but also about george floyd's health conditions because i i know that that is traumatic and it is um 
you know, something that the systemic racism has caused to exist, you know, health problems um, in, in many Black men and women, including the ones that George Floyd had. And so using those as some justification for how he died here uh, is also painful, I'm sure, for people to watch. Um, so I think people need to be prepared if they watch the closing arguments that that is what they're going to hear. Um, but I do think I, I'm hopeful um, that the state has put on a good case in terms of causation and use of force. And I, I feel optimistic about the outcome. I, I would agree um, with everything Mary said, um, particularly about uh, we don't know who, who, the, who the sides are arguing to. We don't know who in that jury the state is arguing to and the defense is arguing to. Um, but I, I wanna also pick up on the dog whistle <clears throat> theme because I, I think it's one of those things that uh, we do have to continue to call out and to really, and I think it's not only the defense actually, I think that the state is using a couple of silent arguments um, that are ultimately destructive. One being the bad apple narrative that this is not a systemic problem. I mean, you have the, the chief of police, you have all of these officers paraded out saying, no, 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 this isn't how we do things. This is how we do things. When in fact, we really know that this is how they do things. And so by, by distancing themselves so clearly from Chauvin saying that he's not one of us, ultimately what's a conviction gonna get in terms of systemic reform? Not a whole lot, unless we hold, and I saw Nakima posted this on Facebook a couple of weeks ago when Arandando said, this isn't what we do. Okay, well then let's hold them accountable for that. This isn't what we do. You said this isn't what we do. So that's number one. This, this trial is not a trial of the system. Um, and you know that was a choice made by the state. Okay, they wanted a conviction. They figure, okay, let's, let's do the bad apple narrative. That's our best chance of conviction. That's not justice. And then the second thing, and this is related to what Mary was saying about the trauma of the eyewitnesses, that the black pain is being used as part of the state's case theory. It's becoming a piece of evidence of itself. And in that, becoming a spectacle. That, that the jury, I'm afraid that, that the silent argument being made is, look, you on the jury who are so uncomfortable here, you can solve this problem. You can answer this specific black pain by convicting this guy. That'll make it okay. So it's this false promise that somehow convicting Chauvin is going to solve anything, but also this real objectification of these young men and women and these elders who are, are, are legitimately traumatized and putting them on the stand and crossing and cross-examining them and leading them on direct and preventing them from telling their stories the way they want to tell their stories is further traumatizing them to no end. A conviction of Chauvin will in no way address that trauma unless we, we writ large, continue to surface these dog whistles, which are taking place on both sides. So, so I agree, I think a conviction is uh, knock on everything. Yeah, maybe. And so what? I mean, then what? So it's, uh, it's a little intimidating to follow up uh, after those pretty deep um, analysis of dog whistles and, and, and of the trial. Um, but but I, I will just, your, your last comment um, is, is that that's our status quo as Black folks in Minnesota. It's like, if you win, you lose. If you lose, you win. There's just really no outcome from the system that you can actually trust and rely on to provide justice. We don't have a justice system. We have a crime and punishment system. And if you think about the punitive nature of our criminal justice system, you know, it, it is true that not even just for Jared Chauvin or for anyone, but the brother who robbed my crib on Christmas day in 2005, like sending him to jail did nothing for me and <laughs> the things that I lost on that day. 
the punitive nature and, and our addiction to being so punitive in response to how harm is caused in our community, it does nothing for us. It creates a system that focuses 100% on the people who cause harm and does nothing to rebuild and repair in the community. So in regards to the trial, like I, I co-signed to everything that was just said around, around the dog whistles. Um, and and that's a, and it basically is it is a head nod towards the uh, frailness of legal strategy, right? Like you have to pick one racist strategy over the other racist strategy, and at the end of the day, like you're not providing the service to the community that that is needed. Um, so so in that respect, like I will comment on this. Um, you know, so I know some of the officers who who testified. One of them I grew up with. Um, and I thought he showed extreme resolve and, and, and just ex extremely just like, this is how a black man shows up and takes charge of the scene and, and make sure that, make sure that um, you, you treat it like a critical incident, even though there's been no direction to treat it that way, right? Like someone who's black, who's from the neighborhood, understands right away what's ha what he walked into and what has happened. Um, I'll also say, you know, in regards to the folks who, who testified, I mean, yeah, like that's not a thing that black folks in the community sign up to do. And so it required just an immense amount of courage from young people and, and our elders. And I mean, you have the full scope of the community on the scene begging for this man's life. And I think that you cannot give those people enough credit and enough praise for standing up in this moment to champion the best of what our community has to offer, even though even though there are folks who are gonna watch that, there are folks who watch that, who saw that, who are gonna reflect on that and not be impressed. They're not gonna see the courage that those folks put on display and they're gonna see threats and they're gonna see what the defense is arguing. And then to the point of the, of, <laughs> of, of this whole, uh, you know, scary black man narrative and whatnot, um, you know, I just, I really have to just give credit to Donna Williams and how he responded. Uh, to that line of questioning and every, I mean, every black man has been in a situation where, where someone has tried to paint you as, ang as an angry black man as a threat to justify um, basically, you know, you know, a great deal of things, including murder. And I think that, um, you know, watching that uh, as a community member, like I was just proud to see a brother take advantage of a moment to stand up to those type of dog whistles. Um, so then finally, like my last point is just that in regards to conviction, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a, a elderly white woman, a Republican who lives in greater Minnesota. Um, and she's convinced, she is convinced that, that Derek Chauvin is going to prison. And um, unfortunately, I am not, I am not. My understanding, and once again, I'm not a lawyer, is that you only need one juror to, to throw this thing. And I believe that people do things for a reason. So the defense is speaking to that one juror. And I think that, you know, we have to be prepared for, for what happens if this dude doesn't go to prison, if he gets, if he gets acquitted. And, and I, you know, I would like to say I fear for that moment, but since we're living through that moment again, because officers are, are willing to be assaulted by white 62-year-old white men in Hutchinson who drag them down the street and hit them with a the hammer, um, and that dude makes it into custody safely. But, uh, but the fact that, you know, we can't get the same kind of treatment in, in our community means that we just, we're just going to have to prepare for what this means. Um, I am not optimistic and that's hard for me to say because I tend to be a pretty hopeful human, but, um, but I trust this justice system to do what it always has done. And um, I trust our community uh, to be on the other end of this and pick up the pieces, put it back together and demand a complete, a complete transformation of how we do law enforcement in the state of Minnesota. I'll just say real quick, just to piggyback off of the excellent comments that have been made by my co-panelists, um, I don't want white people to minimize the importance of a conviction. Even while we're saying this won't change the overall system, we will get some satisfaction knowing Derek Chauvin is spending time in prison. That's the bottom line. Because we look at so many cases throughout our history where we couldn't be witnesses. We could not, we couldn't testify. We, we couldn't even sue in court, right? Dehumanization through the judicial process, not being able to exercise our constitutional rights. And so that is one aspect of why this is so important 
uh, fighting for the dignity of a black man's life who can no longer be here to tell his own story. The dignity of the black witnesses and their strength and their courage and standing on the sidelines and standing against a racist police system and individual police officers who could have shot them, tasered them, threatened to, they did pe threaten to pepper spray them on site with you know putting their hands on their pepper spray, all that. That is one reason that this is important, not to mention the fact that Derek Chauvin has sent a lot of black people to prison. So to have him get that same treatment of understanding you violate the law, you're going to have your freedom taken away from you, that absolutely needs to happen. And we cannot minimize that. We cannot pretend that that does not matter because it does. And a similar satisfaction as to what I saw with Kim Potter in that orange jumpsuit. I thought about all the black people that she has placed in an orange jumpsuit because she thought that she was above the law. So a conviction is imperative. And I do agree that the defense attorney is looking for one or more of those jurors, at least three of whom had ties to law enforcement to try to convince them that everything under the sun, except Derek Chauvin's knee is responsible for George Floyd's death. And a hung jury and an acquittal in my opinion are just as bad because of the re-traumatization that is gonna happen to the community either way. And as Justin said, the outcome that we will have to prepare for and we know that if there is an uprising in the city, folks are gonna be prepared to protect property by any means necessary, which will likely mean more loss of black life, which is what we saw happen in the aftermath of George Floyd being killed when at least two other black men were killed by vigilantes. And Mike Freeman has declined to bring charges against them, against the white men who killed those black men. So that is our reality here. And we want to see a conviction and we want to see overarching systemic change. It's not one or the other. It's, it's all of the above. It's long overdue. That's what we're fighting for. Thanks all for jumping in on that for that great conversation. You know, there are some, there's a couple of technical questions that have come in. Um, I think folks want to know a little bit about what is, um, what does it take to get a hung jury versus an acquittal? And so I think maybe we could talk a little bit about that briefly. Um, but I also wonder if you might comment a bit on um, what, if anything, went well for the defense um, in this space. You know, what should people be worried about if, if, if um, defense attorney Nelson is speaking to that one juror, right, that we all know that they need to get the, the hung jury? Um, what is the, what is it that might have stood out? What, if anything, went well? Because I, I would agree with Mary's analysis, having practiced as a defense attorney for a long time, this not much went well from my perspective, but I'm not in the courtroom. So what, you know, if you were on that jury, what, what might've stood out for you? And could someone just speak to the, the technical question really quick? I can, oh, go ahead. No, Mary, you wanna do the technical question? You're certainly better prepared to do oh, that. <laughs> I, you know, it actually made me think, you know, of, of Justin, when, when you were talking about following you know, I, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer, a public defender for 31 years. I have worked inside the system. I've seen what happens, but I don't have that lived experience. And so it is so helpful for me um, to hear what you have to say, um, you and Nakima. Um, and I just want to thank you for sharing what must be extremely difficult. Um, as to the technical question, here's what happens. Um, if the jury, if somebody, if they don't, if they can't come up with a decision, so they have to be unanimous to convict. Um, and if they, or acquit, if they cannot agree, they'll send a note to the uh, judge essentially saying, we're hung, we can't agree. At that point, the judge will call them into the courtroom and say, go back and try again. Um, this is not a case, nor most cases don't work like this. Then he's not gonna let the jury off the hook. He's gonna make them go back. Um, and deliberate until they just say there's no way, no how, and they've given it a good, and I'm talking about days here. Um, I will also say that they are sequestered, um, which means they have to be kept together in a hotel, which tends to make the jurors want to come back with a decision um, because they can't go home until they do. 
And that puts tremendous pressure on people. So even if there is that one, and here's my optimist coming out again, even if there is that one person who would listen for the, and I, Sarah, to your question, it's the um, defense saying, we have an expert who can't even figure out what the cause of death is. If an expert can't do that, there's reasonable doubt. So that's my biggest worry, although I still think um, this state is okay. Um, but because they're sequestered, that one person is going to have a lot of pressure on them or those two people. The other people are going to be on their backs. They don't get to go home and get refreshed and come back and argue again. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of pressure for agreement here. And I think that's a good thing for the state. I, I again, I, I agree. I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that the defense significantly overpromised in their opening in terms of what uh, would be produced uh, reasonable doubt of causation and um, uh, what was the other? Oh, and cause of death. Um, I, I think what the defense is going to have to do and, and seems inclined to do is to lean more heavily and to double down on the on the racist tropes we've been talking about, both the unruly crowd and the scary black man. You know, well, he's a big guy. We, you know, we don't know what he's going to do. He, he might be coming off something. You know, that is that those are the dog whistles that are, are they, they, they kind of get in there. And I don't think the evidence is there. Like I said, I think he overpromised that and underdelivered, but it's there enough, and he really did stick to it. I mean, his two experts, the the tough guy use of force expert, saying, "Oh yeah, there's nothing wrong with what he did." Yeah, that's that's, and the Rhodesian pathologist, who I mean, Mary, I think you tweeted this. This this the expert on cause of death was this guy who has a history of in South Africa, um, in the apartheid area era. So, I mean, that, that is starting to sound less like a dog whistle and more, more like a, hey, hey, look what I'm doing over here. This is white supremacy. You convict this guy, you're giving in to, 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 to the mob. Um, I don't think he's gonna succeed, but I'm afraid that the closing argument is going to end up being very ugly with those undertones. Um, and ultimately, as, as I think you've all said, um, traumatic for the community. And just to pick you back real quick, I think that when Carolyn was saying that those things get in there, those dog whistles and those stereotypes, I think they definitely can get in there for white people. But if this were an all black jury, honestly, I don't think there would be any question <laughs> as to people being able to see very clearly what this is. As we've talked about during these past sessions, there are two native born black people on that jury. Out of 12 uh, jurors and a total of 14 individuals overall, which means that the rest of the jurors likely have had a very different experience than what we tend to experience here. I'm not sure how that will affect the outcome of this trial. I'm very concerned Again, not because the defense, they put on a horrible case, but knowing how deep white supremacy and systemic racism run and how that might manifest in people's decision-making. Can I jump in and, and say actually that the last two jurors chosen are the alternates and they're both white. And so we are going to see a jury of 12, um, six white people and, and six not white people which is good. Uh, I, I completely agree with you, Nikima, but it is good that the two alternate, that it's not one of the two um, African-Americans uh, or people of color that are going to be the alternates that are going to be removed. There is a technical question from folks. I'm just trying to get some of these answered for people that about whether, um, will the alternate alternates be sequestered as well? And where does the deliberation happen? Is it at the hotel or at the court? Uh, the alternates are not part of the deliberation. Deliberations happen in court and they're just taken to the hotel uh, at night when they're finished deliberating. 
Thanks. And so I wonder if we could talk a little bit about um, the contrasting medical testimony. The state put on several medical experts, um, the defense not as much. And then, you know, so what do we make about the, you know, what do you make of the differences um, between the, the medical testimony put on by both sides? And then also there was a thing that happened today that someone asked a question about, which was the threat of a mistrial from Cahill, um, which I think caught attention from a lot of people, but um, for those of us, you know, who I think practice in this space, it was not as big of a deal, but I think maybe if we could just explain what happened there and unpack that a little bit for folks. Uh, so yes, um, when you, when you're in court, basically what Cahill was doing was just giving a strong warning that he did not want the state's rebuttal witness, Dr. Tobin to talk about a certain thing. And he was just trying to make it very clear. If he does talk about that certain thing, he would declare a mistrial. So there was no danger of a mistrial being declared. And, and people might notice that he gave Blackwell three minutes. He, he was like, it was three minutes to 10 or something. And Cahill said, we're coming back at 10. And, and Blackwell's kind of like, because he had to go out and talk to Tobin and tell him what was not to come in. <laughs> and so he wanted time to go tell him. So that's why Cahill said, you can come back at 10, 15. So you can bet that Blackwell was in wherever talking to Tobin saying, here's what you can say, here's what you cannot say. Um, and what he did end up talking about was a blood test that was taken, and I won't go into the weeds on it, but essentially said that there was no evidence of carbon monoxide poisoning. There was evidently a different test specifically on that that somehow got lost somewhere, and that's what the judge did not allow him to talk about. So that's what that issue was about. I wonder if others want to jump in just on what you heard in the medical testimony and what stood out to you and the difference differences there. Dr. Tobin was a superstar and I am just, I'm grateful to that man. You know, honestly, regardless of the outcome, the fact that he was so brilliant on the stand in articulating the medical evidence behind um, what we all saw on the video, like he's, reminding us as the prosecution said, you can believe your own eyes. And so his testimony really, really reinforced that notion in terms of talking about how George Floyd was killed and the way in which um, Derek Chauvin's knee and the pavement and the pressure to his body all contributed to um, positional asphyxia. We all learned a lot through his testimony because he was like a master teacher um, in that courtroom, inviting the jury to touch their necks and really get into the testimony and think critically about what happened and why it happened. And so that, I don't, when we heard Dr. Tobin, I'm like, I don't know how they're gonna come back from that, from the defense perspective. And they, I don't think they were able to come back from that. I think they had a total of 14 or 15 medical um, expert witnesses on their list, but they, I'm saying the defense, they had a slew of them, but they didn't call them you know, to the stand. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but um, I'm just thankful for Dr. Tobin. And the fact that he volunteered his time, like to me, that that um, is evidence of his passion surrounding what happened and not wanting the um, defense attorney and Chauvin to get over on the public or on the jury with the lame theories that they were proposing. Yeah, I think that Dr. To I, I totally agree with Nikima that Dr. Tobin was the kind of expert that um, makes the legal system look good in that he was there legitimately to help the jury, legitimately to help the fact finder make sense of what, what the other side was trying to make really complicated and confusing. And he was just saying, no, believe what you see and let me explain it using terms that you'll understand. Experts so often are, are, are used to kind of obfuscate things and make, the, make this distinction between the, the legal language and you know, what the law says versus what we all understand about the world. And I, I think the defense witness did just that. Like there was this real disconnect between what we all and what the jury and what we all have been experiencing over these past weeks um, that in order to believe what the defense expert was saying, you really had to 
to ignore everything that had come before, whereas the prosecution expert was saying, no, believe what you see. And here, let me tell you the science behind it. So I agree with Nikima. He was, I found him just, and of course, the fact that he, you know, has this lovely, gentle, lilting voice and he's a little rumpled professor. There's nothing intimidating about him. It was very effective. You know, once again, not an expert on medical experts or anything like that, but um, the one thing I, I, that that's, sticks out to me about this conversation is that you basically have the two dynamics where it's like, the defense is telling you, you can't believe your eyes and the and the, the prosecution is saying, believe your eyes. And I think it's, a I don't wanna glaze over that point because it's a, it's a, it's a old trope that has been used repeatedly in, in to defend officers. When um, I served for uh, something like uh, uh, five years on the Minneapolis Civilian Review Authority back when that's what it was called. Now the Office of the Officer mis Misconduct. And this is this was like literally our debate every time we reviewed video and evidence of, of mis Officer Misconduct. And, and we would look at the Deputy Chief at the time and they would tell us, you can't believe everything you see on video, right? You can't believe your eyes. And in, in, in reference to the Chauvin trial, I just thought it was, I, I agree. Like, I just thought it was really smart to bring somebody out who could like actually like communicate in layman's terms and not legal speak and say, you can believe your eyes. This is how this is how this happened. And and the other thing I'll just say, just briefly, um, I'm reading a book right now called Afro Pessimism that really talks about the dehumanization of, of, of Black people and the idea that the middle passage was an apocalypse for Black people, that our humanity was erased. And I think that anytime you see, you know, like this, this trial, for example, it's just a clear cut example how it is hard to see black people as human right rather that be under the knee of an officer or going to get medical treatment your damn self at, at, at the doctor and being you know treated like you can take more pain or whatever right or the uh, I think about you know uh, 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 black women giving birth right and 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 the disproportionate rates of um, of, of unsuccessful births with children dying or women being injured during childbirth. Like, like there is a dehumanization of blackness that is strung deep within the systems that are supposed to serve our community. And literally the legal arguments, <laughs> if you strip them back, are, are being focused on that. One side is saying, this is a man who was, who was, who was killed by this officer. We watched him take his last breath last breath calling for his mama. And the other side is saying, well, you know, it could have been drugs because black people, you know, they, they, you know, or it could have been, you know, he's, he's got heart disease, you know, black people and their hearts. Right. And, and it's, and, and, and it's just, it's really sickening. Um, and it's something that we have to reckon with, you know. I wonder, Sarah, you know, Sarah, yeah, go ahead, it, just, it just reminded me of excited delirium. You know, I was exactly about to prompt that conversation, so go for it, please. Yeah, I, I, it was the, this whole concept of this thing that they refer to as excited delirium that the American Medical Association doesn't accept as a thing, yet uh, the, mini, or the Minnesota Post Board uh, allows uh, police officers to be trained on it, to be making a medical diagnosis of something that most doctors don't exist. But what's I mean, what made me rem reminded me of it is that it only seems to apply to black men who are interacting with police. And some of the signs or the big sign that I always think of is they have superhuman strength. You know, and somebody said, what is superhuman strength? And we heard that come up in the trial as kind of a, well, we have to hold him down because even though he is passed out, um, he may come awake and exhibit superhuman strength and the four of us can't subdue him. So I just wanted to bring that up as something that is about race and is problematic. And the police in Minnesota need to be or stop being trained on that um, because it is not a legitimate medical diagnosis and police shouldn't be making diagnosis in the field, which actually leads them to use more force. And it, it is almost always on black men. So as a member of the post board appointed in February, yeah. we'll just take <laughs> formerly the seat of uh, Clarence Castile. Um, and 
so I will just say that, yes, like these are the things that we're looking at at the post board, starting with First Amendment. I was going to mention this earlier for First Amendment protections and how off and creating a model policy for how officers disperse large group, uh, large crowds like day one next Thursday. That's what we'll be talking about and look, examining standards and training across the board. I think that the post board is something that people um, my organization is planning on doing some some educated education work around it. I think it's something that people need to be paying attention to because that is one significant level of power. The same way it is taught folks about delirium and, and superhuman strength, like allow approve these trainings, right? Like it, it's time that we start having trainings on white supremacy and, and, and the roots of white supremacy and how white supremacy is steeped in law enforcement. And, and, and beyond training, setting a standard so that officers can't go shoot guns with the Proud Boys on the weekends, a basic standard that all of you as law, law professionals have a similar standard about who you can associate with, right? Like you can, hanging out with hate groups, not good for lawyers, right? Um, and so these are things, so I'm glad you brought that up, Marianne. And um, I just wanted to, to, to put that plug out there. Um, watch your post board. We got a lot of work to do there. I'm so excited you're on the post board, Justin. That's really great news. Um, we've had an audience question that's been hanging out there for a bit, and I think it's relevant to this discussion, which is, tra is training the issue, right? Like, can you train your way out of this? Or, you know, what is the solution? Because you have Chauvin, who's training other officers, right? You've got Potter, who's training other officers. Um, is training part of the solution? Um, you know, because I hear Justin, when you're talking about training, you're talking about training that's entirely different. You're talking about training about white supremacy and anti-racism. So could we comment briefly on that? I would just say I'm not a big, we spent the last maybe like five years, like really put, or 10 years really putting a lot of focus on criminal justice reform for policing on training, right? And uh, Valerie Castile, I think it describes it best. Like we don't need no more training. Like they, they made the training in her son's name and it's still not enacting the change that, that we need. It's, it, we have to go beyond training. We, we have to go, we have to, we have to look at the fact that these systems and structures in, in the law enforcement uh, uh, field were set up to do nothing. 40 years ago, they developed a post board that literally doesn't even have an investigative unit. So how is it supposed to look into officer misconduct? They're not collecting enough data. They're, so training to me, like we'll get to that. But, for, but first we have to like, we have to sort of like uh, restructure things, which is going through the, and these aren't, this is not me talking about my like uh, aspirations. The post board is currently going through an administrative rules process. It's been through an audit. It is looking at itself and trying to figure out what, how to retool and, and reconfigure. Last summer, uh, I was able to add a, a civilian body. I worked with uh, lawmakers. I didn't add it. Let me be clear. I was able to work with lawmakers and activists to add a civilian body to the post board so that there's actually civilian voice on the post board as opposed to all these sep I mean, it's good to have civilian oversight at the local level. But having at the state level, you know, makes a huge difference. So training is a piece of it, but you actually have to shift the actual structure before you can even get to standards and training. Um, this isn't a conversation about the post board, so I'm just going to leave it there. But uh, but but I think it's clear how it influences the the what happens on the street. I think it's a, a both and though, because when you look at the amount of training that officers receive, they receive less training than folks going into the field of cosmetology, right? And other fields that are not about a life or death situation. So I think training is one aspect of it. Um, I also think that their training on de-escalation has been inadequate. Most of their training has been very toxic. It has tapped into white male aggressive behavior in terms of compliance, compliance. Right, compliance. right, right. That's yep. all you hear and compliance is so baked into how they function and how they respond when they are dealing with people. That goes to their training. Some of them have received that warrior training that finally the uh, Minneapolis Police Department outlawed. And then when Bob Crow was head of the union, he brought it back mm -hmm. and offered it for free you know, to the officers. And so that warrior training is what was ultimately, in my opinion, in the mind of Euronimo Yanez, when he decided to fire upon Philando Castile uh, back in 2016. 
So training does matter. It is, a, I think it's a both and situation. I also do think there needs to, we need to move beyond like this flowery language, like that is implicit bias. Right. This is about legitimacy. No, it's about right. white supremacy. Right. Right. <laughs> and the need to focus on, as I think Justin was saying, anti-racism which I don't think is covered. I remember when I was a law professor at St. Thomas, I went to the folks who worked in the Masters of Police Leadership program and I was asking them many years ago about the training. And I said, how do you talk to officers about racism, white supremacy, the civil rights movement and how police officers misuse and abuse their power against protesters? And he's like, are you kidding me? It's like the closest we can get to any of those topics is talking about the Holocaust. I'm like what he's like yeah and even that is difficult to broach with these cops i'm like this is absolutely outrageous you know i was it made me think about the defense use of force expert barry broad yeah yeah exactly <laughs> this is the mindset i mean i agree it's it's training but it's this mindset i mean listening to him talk saying it was all about one upsmanship and you know to hear him talk it was escalation. Mm -hmm. It was, if somebody takes a swing at me, I can club them in the head with a stick. <laughs> and so that's a mindset. Um, and I, you know, I always go back to the implicit bias training that I attended with the 20 cops one Saturday when a lieutenant at my table, and that's important because police are so hierarchical. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, announced that this was a waste of his time, but also when he was asked, or they were all asked about their goals, said, I want to maintain my warrior mentality because that's why I became a cop. And I think we have to remember that this country launched a war on drugs, which was a war on black and brown people. And we wanted cops to be, you know, this warrior kind of thing. Um, and so there are a lot of cops that are in unfortunate um, supervisory positions that have that mindset and they need to go. They, there needs to be accountability. And I think this goes back to what was testified to in this trial. You had the MPD people coming in and saying this, there's this aspiration, at least that's how I look at it. You know, these are not our values, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But people who do this work, public defenders and people in the community, right see that it happens all the time, every day, not to this extreme, but there needs to be accountability for the day-to-day -day interactions that police have with people in our community. Just real quick, when Mary says we wanted our cops to be warriors, you saw my white folks. Oh, yeah. We definitely yeah. didn't. I just yeah. have to plug that. We did not I, want that. We just want, if you have to call 911, I, I just show up who's competent and capable. We don't want you know, what we experience right now with that level of aggressive behavior. We and white people, can I amend that? <laughs> can, I, can I jump in on that? Just like, the, it, this gets back to the punitive nature of the criminal legal system. Right. That every interaction is a criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, that's a criminal investigation now, right? Like tabs expired, air freshener, it's all a criminal, it's all a criminal investigation. And the reality is that that's not what we need. We need services, right? So the voucher program that was piloted in Minneapolis where you pull someone over and you give them a, t a voucher to get their taillight fixed is far more effective than, than you know, arresting someone for warrants in Oakland recently they got they don't even have cops doing traffic stops right they have they have they have a, a office of uh, of traffic of, of traffic patrol I believe it's called or something like that where you have the same when cops in Minneapolis don't check meters right mm -hmm. like like this is this there are we need to reduce the footprint of contact between law enforcement and the community and the reality is the biggest advocates for this should be the police the biggest advocates for the issues of facing the black community should be the police. Policing and law enforcement doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It happens in a very specific environment. So if, if housing is, is an issue, if, uh, if economic uh, uh, development and, and jobs and all those things are issues, officers should be number one out there advocating for that stuff because it makes their jobs easier. Reducing the, the footprint of how we interact with each other is necessary in order to have some form of law enforcement, because the current form we have has got to go, but some form of law enforcement where people can trust the services that they get. I mean, it's a simple question. I was on a call with um, 
uh, I'm, a, I'm Mr. Brother's name, but he's uh, uh, from the policing project at NYU, and um, and he had just said like, what do people want when you call when when you pick up and call nine one one? You know, I'm gonna be honest. Like the reason I'm not an abolitionist is because if someone's shooting up Walmart down the block from my crib, I call the SWAT team. I'm I'm cool with that, right? But if but if we are talking about all these litany of other interactions that we have that lead to these tragic outcomes, like what happened to Dante Wright, what happened to Philando, what happened to George Floyd, what happened to Jamar, what happened to Q the blacksmith, and what happened, you know, like we can't. Like, like we, we can't continue to allow that those interactions, the punitive legal system to show up in those moments because the punitive legal system only knows one way of being. Right. It's not a warrior, it's a predator. It is working exactly the way it is designed to work. So if we want a different outcome, we have to acknowledge that the system is working the way it's designed to work. It's a system based on white supremacy, based on white control over black bodies, based on this idea of reasonable fear of blackness. And there's no way to tinker with that. There's no way to say, oh yeah, but if we have more black chiefs, that'll solve the problem. Uh, it's, it, we got to change why, I mean, and I think Justin, your question is perfect. Why do we want the police? So start from that. What does the community need from law enforcement or from social services? And to get the answer to that question, we have to talk to the members of the community, right? We have to go down to 38th and Chicago and talk to who was on the corner that day. And, you know, I'm not talking about that day, but just community responsive, not community responsive policing, but community involvement in the post board and, and other community or organizations, things like that. But I agree. And the officers should be a part of that. They should want to be a part of that because that's the counter narrative, you know, that, that white supremacy and, and the, the a punitive system of law enforcement and the legal system, uh, what's the counter narrative to that? Transformative justice, right? Or, or collaborative um, social network. Um, I don't even know what policing, policing has never existed in America outside the context of enforcing runaway, you know, uh, uh, as, a, as a tool of slaveholders, of enforcing slave rules. So how can we even imagine a system that isn't burdened with that legacy? Um, I mean, it feels like we have to kind of shed that skin, like get out from that trap that that uh, prison of white supremacy in order to imagine what would policing look and feel like if it didn't have all of that weight all of that baggage um, and it's I mean it's exciting but it's it we can't get there until we acknowledge for real what this system is burdened with Thank you all for this just incredibly insightful, valuable conversation. As usual, we're just flying through our time together. Um, so I just want to pose a final question for this evening um, for our last 10 minutes or so here. You know, this is our fourth forum and throughout we've really wrestled with this idea of justice and it's become abundantly clear that um, although a conviction in this trial is, is critically important, um, that this one trial um, or, or Chauvin specific conviction is not going to get us to true justice. Um, you know, we have the trial for the other three officers coming up later this summer. You know, we've got now this case moving forward for Kim Potter. Um, is this our new normal that we'll be constantly, you know, trying police for the murder of Black folks and consider that to be, pro you know, sufficient progress? Uh, how do we break out of that cycle? Um, you know, how has this, you know, how has this trial harmed or helped the movement for legal system transformation? You know, any reflections um, on what are meaningful steps towards justice as we close in on closing arguments next week? And I can promise our audience uh, we will be back in some format after there's a verdict in this case to have a, another discussion. But, you know, as we look towards closing arguments, as we look towards closing out this trial, I wonder if folks could could comment on any of those multiple questions I just threw at you. I don't, I don't know if this is a new normal because we're not deep enough into it yet. We're, we're finally seeing one officer, actually one white officer on trial for killing a black person. We haven't even gotten into a routine of seeing this type of 
accountability, even if it's a semblance of accountability. Because what I hear from people is, okay, what's next beyond this? I'm like, we're not even out of this yet. <laughs> In terms of trying to see how does this experiment work of trying to hold a white officer accountable for killing a black person in a lily white state that does not want to openly acknowledge its problems with race. I mean, that's huge. That's part of why the whole world is watching because they had a certain vision of what this environment was like from the outside that black people are trying to tell them about from the inside. And now they're beginning to see it for themselves and beginning to experience what we have been trying to say for a very long time. So I do hope that the new normal is accountability because it is going to take a while to uproot a rotten system and to uproot the thousands of police officers who are part of the problem on many, many levels. And so as we, you know, as we reimagine, you got to do something with the current system. And that doesn't mean that we can ignore what's going on right now because we're trying to move ahead. We have to deal with the moment while also envisioning the future. And that for me also includes how lawyers are trained. Someone in the comments said, what, what kind of person is Eric Nelson? I don't know him personally, I have a whole bunch of opinions about what kind of person I think he is, but, but it symbolizes how law students are trained or not trained to think about race. Because remember what he said, this isn't about race. And I was like, I bet he went to Hamlin, Mitch. Anyway, no offense there, but <laughs> you know I had to go there, Carolyn. But as somebody, anyway, the point is, <laughs> a lot of this also has to do with the way that race is and is not taught in law school and the lens by which lawyers are taught to view the system. And that means prosecutors, public defenders, criminal defense attorneys, and those who become judges. All of them play a role in what happens with police on the streets and whether they push for accountability or whether they rubber stamp the status quo. So I'll end there. I'll, I'll just offer up a couple quick thoughts. So first of all, is this a new normal over my dead body? I wake up every day and I literally go to work every day excited, dreaming of ways to work with more people to help transform the system so that we can have something to brag about in Minnesota. I'm not okay with the fact that the state that I love is, is, is the spark for outrage. I want us to be the example for change. And I believe that, you know, you talk to Minnesotans who love hockey, like they're very boastful, prideful people. Like I, we need to tap into that and get people, get people going on what it could look like to redesign things in this, in this state and be an example for everyone. So that's, so that's first, like, no, I don't think this is the new normal. I think that we are in a transition. Transitions are built with tension, right? Number two, just like a quick comment on justice and accountability. You know, I don't, I do, I reject the idea of a punitive, of punitive justice. There are other types of justice. There is restorative justice. There is transformative justice. Trans key principles of transformative justice say we rely on each other two thirds of the time. We rely on the state one third of the time. And I think that that is, that is a space where we got to get to because what that does is it starts to address some of the issues that in community that we're not dealing with very well at all. So everyone ran an, everyone read an anti-racism book this year but what about misogyny? What about homophobia? What about all these uh, transphobia? What about all these other issues that we're wrestling with? What about community violence in the black community? And really looking at how poverty and policing and law enforcement and other systems are fueling that community violence. And how do we start to address those? What about reparations? These are things that we need to talk about in our community and start advocating for um, with each other. And so I, I do not support punitive justice. Um, and the other thing I'll say about justice and the concepts of justice and accountability is that they are relational. They are relational concepts. The justice, people often focus on the two scales, the symbol of the justice is two scales. And you put a little over here and it goes down or up or whatever, right? What I like to focus on is the bar that connects the two scales. The fact that those things are in relationship to each other and it's hard to get this to get this uh, through people's heads, but nobody likes accountability. When someone approaches you on some, you owe me $20 stuff, like you don't like that interaction. And I think people need to stop, stop thinking about accountability being something for someone else and start realizing that accountability is also for yourself. And that doesn't happen unless you're in genuine relationship with somebody where you can identify shared values, 
build bridges and work together. This is a concept that comes from out of John Powell's Other and Belonging Institute. The idea that police, account of, that police accountability is an issue for black people to solve, right? That is not, this issue belongs to all of us. And, the, and what we have to do if we're gonna talk about justice and accountability is build bridges across between people who disagree with each other, frankly, and figure out a way how to identify shared values that can move us all forward together. That is difficult work. That is work people are in the streets are not feeling right now, and I'm not asking you to, but, but at some point, at some point, we got to build this thing together. Hard to follow that. Um, and I'm just going to say quickly, I accept Nakima's challenge that um, we do as law professionals and me as a law professor have an obligation to model for those who are coming after us the kind of transformational justice or, or collaborative society that we want. And I am very committed to that. Um, and it's challenging because this, this legal system that those of us who are lawyers work in is very powerful and it is entrenched and we are trained to do things certain ways. And when students come from places that are, that haven't, you know, that, that, it doesn't make sense to do things in those ways. It takes humility on the part of those of us who've always done it that way to take that breath and say, yeah, I can see how this way of solving the problem is actually not gonna work and how, how a more collaborative way, a less power driven way um, will be more effective, will be more long lasting. Um, it is hard work and it is complicated work and it's, you don't always see the results. Um, but I agree, Justin, it's, it, it is the work that needs to be done and that I think can be done. I mean, I, the reason I love being a law professor is that the people who are coming up now, the people, Nakima, who you are leading out on the street, I mean, they are going to change the world. Um, we can either make them grilled cheese sandwiches and support them in doing that, or we can get out of the way. Um, and, and I just hope that I ha I'm smart enough and humble enough to stay close, um, you know, so I can keep making the grilled cheese sandwiches. Uh, but yeah, I, I take the challenge, you know, lawyers are not the, the, the um, bringers of good that we like to think we are. Um, and it's important to work with that reality. As so when I was chief public defender, which was for six years, I, I thought for me personally, I needed to talk about the issues that I saw internally with the system to be talking publicly about issues that our community needed to know about. And I realized that the people in the system don't want anybody to know that. They want to talk about being progressive. They want to talk about all the things that they're purportedly doing, but they don't want to do, they don't want, really want to do the work. And I found out the hard way um, that they don't want people talking about it either. Um, but I have become more resolved um, in my mission to continue to talk about what's wrong with the system, all parts of it. And you're right, Nakima, it's public defenders. It's, it's all of us. It's systemic. Um, and we do need to talk about it openly uh, because if people in the public actually knew how the system really works in all of its ways, they would be horrified. And so I look at this as an opportunity, a really big opportunity that we have to seize right now uh, to take action and to push policymakers uh, to take action and to build those partnerships because it, being part of the system, I see the way to keep people out of the system is to get them jobs and housing and support systems that we don't have. And so it's building partnerships with the people that can do that. So I see this as a moment in history, uh, unlike any in my lifetime. Uh, and it's where we all have to re, uh, resolve, even though it's difficult. And I know it's difficult. I know personally it's difficult, but we have to be resolved 
that this is not the type of community we want to live in for all of our community members. And we can work together to change that. Um, because this isn't, I want to live in a community that ends up in the top five of whatever list it is for white and black people. Uh, and we can push to, to make that happen. Well, um, I can't thank you all enough for this incredibly thoughtful, nuanced discussion, uh, particularly this week. I just, you know, we started here and I just want to end here again. This week has been trauma on top of trauma. <clears throat> It's been an incredibly difficult week. And I say that as a white woman. Um, Nikima, Justin, thank you for being here with us tonight and sharing so much of yourself with, with us and with our community. Um, this conversation is incredibly powerful and at the Legal Rights Center, we're committed to continuing this dialogue. Um, <clears throat> Nikima, as you said, we are in the midst of this transition and in the midst of this, you know, everyone talked about transformation. Um, you know, Mary talked about holding folks accountable and that's what we're hoping to do here. So as we close out, and I know we're a couple of minutes over, um, we just wanted to share out some resources about mutual aid for Dante Wright and for Brooklyn Center. Um, I, we have them up on the screen now and we are sharing them out, you know, via our social media. Um, please consider supporting um, Dante Wright's family and our community in these ways. Um, and I hope that you all will continue to stay connected with us throughout, you know, as we go through the end of this trial, as we look towards the upcoming trials, but quite frankly, beyond, as we look towards changing and transforming our systems. Um, in the meantime, um, please be safe. Um, you know, we have our Twin Cities Legal Support Line that's operating 24 hours a day right now. That is the number, please share it out. Um, we are hosting community processing circles, restorative spaces every Friday online. And we're holding an ask an attorney session next Tuesday at four o'clock on Facebook Live with our attorneys. Um, please stay connected with us and we will, uh, I can promise we will be back at, um, in the not too distant future to continue this conversation about community perspectives on justice throughout this trial. Thank you, uh, Justin, Carolyn, Mary, and Nikima. Really appreciate you all being here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.